My name is Navia, and I'd like to thank you all for attending MTHS's first annual TED Talk. So, I'm going to be uh, opening up the discussion uh, today by... <laughs> trying to get this thing to work. <laughs> Uh, sorry, I'm going to be opening up today's discussion by discussing something that intrigues me uh, dearly. The scope for saving lives, advancements in medicine. Okay, so I'd like to kick the evening off by asking you all a few questions. How many of you have seen the image on the top left? Okay, quite a few of you. Uh, how many of you have seen the image on the top right? Again, quite a few of you. Uh, how many of you have seen the bottom image? So, these images depict technologies that are currently in development. Um, so the first image on the top left corner depicts a microchip that is capable of simulating the environment of an actual living organ, kind of like an organ on a chip, and it can serve as an alternative to animal and human testing. The image on the right depicts a series of synthetic hormones. Synthetic hormones can be used to treat a variety of diseases. One type of synthetic hormone can actually increase the chances of surviving of acute heart failure by as much as 37%. Now, the bottom image is one that probably intrigues me or captivates me the most out of all. The bottom image depicts a device that can convert data from CT and MRI scans into actual 3D holographic images of human organs that scientists can interact with. So I think part of what, in, what uh, invoked my interest in the medical field was my own family's history of medical conditions. My family has a history of medical conditions and diseases. So for instance, um, back when I was in elementary school, I remember it was um, in fifth grade, I found out that my uncle had a heart surgery, a cardiovascular surgery. And so my family and I rushed to the hospital and their doctors informed us that my grandfather would need a device called a pacemaker on his heart. And so I was there front and center listening to the doctor as he described how this pacemaker would work. And I didn't comprehend much, I'm going to be honest, but I do recall him describing that it would be a battery-operated device that could keep his heart beating and prolong his existence, essentially, um, by administering electrical impulses. And I was absolutely, I was absolutely captivated by this idea that um, his, he could continue living and carrying out his daily activities just by this device that's operated by a battery on his heart. Another thing was that in November of 2012, that was probably one of the worst months of my life because my uncle had a massive stroke. I remember it was, you know, a relatively uh, humid day for um, a normally cold month easing into winter. My aunt stayed over for a sleepover that night, and we grew up talking, you know, sharing jokes and sharing stories and stuff, and then we all gradually started to, uh, started to fall asleep. Then, maybe around 12.30 or 1 in the morning, she received a phone call, and at the other end was my uncle, and he was speaking, he was incoherently mumbling, like, he was trying to communicate with my aunt, but was unable to, so my aunt was clearly very scared, and she rushed out at 1 o'clock in the morning to go back home and see what was happening. When she got home, uh, there was a neighbor there, and uh, he had informed her that my uncle was unconscious, and so the next day, my family and I are rushing to the hospital because my uncle had apparently suffered a stroke. And I remember when we got there, my sister's reaction was that she immediately, she saw that there was um, kind of like a dent in the side of my uncle's head, where doctors had operated. Um, and she was, she couldn't handle it. She basically just turned and bolted. But for me, I, of course I was, you know, struck by grief and terror, but it invoked curiosity within me, and I stayed there and listened again as surgeons basically described the procedure that they had carried out on my uncle. And I remember um, thinking, you know, I was so fascinated by this d disease, essentially, in the sense that, like, the fact that this disease could take away my uncle's ability to, you know, he had to learn how to say his alphabet to count his numbers, and he couldn't talk, 
or walk for that matter, and he still can't up to this day. The fact that he had gone from you know, a successful CEO to somebody who couldn't even recite his alphabet, that really intrigued my curiosity in the medical field. And so that's basically predominantly what caused me to be so fascinated with advancements in the medical field and te medical technology. Now, from time to time, I find myself thinking about how remarkable it is that we've come so far since the reign of our early ancestors, back when something as seemingly small to us as a cold could lead to pneumonia, which had minimal treatments at the time, which could in turn lead to the untimely demise of the person who had it. Prior to the 1800s, common and moderate illnesses, uh, such as sinus infections and indigestion, were treated with medicine or herbs, such as the ones that you see on the screen. Ginger, chamomile, uh, basil, marigold. Now, the first doctors were known as medicine men, and they actually uh, traced back medical conditions and illnesses to maybe the acts of a devil, a sin that that person had committed, misfortune, or even supernatural activity. Now, they used interesting processes to attempt to cleanse their patients of the evil that had been cast upon them. So on the left, you know, you see a hole drilled into a skull, and that basically represents the process of trepanning. And trepanning was a process of drilling a 2.5 to 5 centimeter hole in the skulls of patients. Now, the image on the right depicts another process known as bloodletting. And what bloodletting was, was that it, it involved cutting uh, open the patient's skin and letting their blood spill into a waste bin. Now, just envision your regular checkups. You go to the doctors, they check your uh, ears, your uh, throat, and other things, and then you're out, basically, right? But now envision having to sit in a chair while somebody physically cuts open your skin and takes your blood out. Like, it was absolutely atrocious, but luckily, uh, come the 18th century, a time period known as the Enlightenment occurred. Now, how many of you know what the Enlightenment is? Okay, so for those of you who don't know, the Enlightenment was basically a period of time in which practicality and reasoning rose above theology. People began to seek answers to unexplained phenomena, rather than turning to the church for all of their answers as they had done previously. The Enlightenment was preceded by a time period known as the Scientific Revolution, depicted in the picture on the right, and it was a contributing factor of the Enlightenment. And it, additionally, during the Enlightenment, interest in public health and medicinal sciences increased significantly. Hospitals began to appear. Scientists began to experiment with actual medications rather than resorting to faith healings for everything. And on top of that, secular medicine emerged. Sorry. Um, okay, so fast forward again to the 20th century. Now, during the 20th century, as I'm sure we're all aware, uh, two major global catastrophes occurred. World Wars I and II. Now, World Wars I and II, yes, they devastated millions of lives and caused millions of casualties. But, they did lead to major medical breakthroughs. Now, the image that you see on the left is an image of a soldier who underwent facial reconstruction surgery. You see, doctors improved facial reconstruction surgery because soldiers were suffering artillery fragments directly to the face. Now, the images that you see on the top right and bottom left uh, depict antiseptics and how they were used. You see, before antiseptics emerged, doctors would have to chop off the entire limbs of patients, but antiseptics emerged and served as an alternative to that. And then the fourth image you see on the bottom right is of Alexander Fleming, who in 1928 discovered a bacteria known as penicillium, which then led to the manufacturing of the first antibiotic substance, penicillin, which we still use today. Now, fast forward again to the 21st century, uh, the, you know, current century. Me, personally, I enjoy reading 
news articles. Um, they really, I really like to keep up with current events. They intrigue me very much. Not the political ones, um, more so the ones that are not revolved around politics. Um, so recently, I read about a few, med few medical breakthroughs that have recently occurred, and one of them is involves facial transplant. The image that you see on the top left is of a young woman named Katie Stubblefield. Now, Katie Stubblefield was facing much emotional distress in her life, and unfortunately, she decided she would take her life at her brother's home. She attempted to inflict a gunshot wound and thus, you know, commit suicide, but she was unsuccessful. Now, she became the youngest recipient of a nearly, nearly full facial surgery, facial transplant surgery. And as you can see, she received a nearly full face from another woman who had passed away from, um, alcohol, uh, from an alcohol addiction. And she claimed that it gave her a second chance at life. Now the image on the top right is of Jason Kosher. Jason Kosher was Jason Kosher enjoyed riding his ATV on his family farm. It was an activity he carried out from day to day, but then one day he struck a power line, and that led to him being in a coma for nearly three days. And when he woke up, he found out the doctors had amputated both his arms, and they were replaced with bionic arms that the doctors had programmed uh, an iPad app for, and that iPad app could be used to adjust the grip settings on his bionic arms. So he could pinch, he could pull, he could shake hands, he could carry out daily, basic day-to-day -day activities. And as you can see on Jason's arms are images of his two daughters. The reason for that is doctors asked him, you know, if you could have one thing again, what would it be? And he said, I want to be able to hold my two daughters in my arms again. And so they also programmed the app to display images of his daughters on his arms. I know, I'm touching. And the third image is of targeted cell therapy. Now, Targeted cell therapy is common. What is common is chemotherapy and radiation, but these therapies target both healthy cells and tumor cells, which leads to disastrous side effects in cancer patients, such as hair loss and severe nausea. So targeted cell therapies, cancer cell therapies, they target solely the tumor cells um, and not the healthy cells, and can thus produce side effects greatly. So I basically discussed the past, how you know remarkably advanced the medical field has become since our ancestors, and I've discussed the present, current, uh, current remedies that are emerging. But what about the future? What does the future of medicine hold? So the image that you see on the top right is basically um, an image of a mind-reading device that can free paralyzed muscles. So, excuse me, muscle cells. So scientists are basically experimenting with a robot, a robotic exoskeleton that is capable of reading people's minds in addition to enabling them to get where they need to. So the device consists of a skull cap and a robotic exoskeleton. The skull cap basically collects information and it transmits it in the form of electrical signals to the robotic exoskeleton, which can then um, enable that person who's paralyzed to get where they need to go. So imagine uh, a person with paralysis, uh, imagine a glass of water before them. They don't even need to think, they can simply move towards that glass of water and grab it and take a sip out of it, you know, as they would if they didn't have paralysis. And the image on the right is one that perhaps most of you will recognize. How many of you uh, recognize CRISPR? or are aware of CRISPR and its functions in some way. Now CRISPR is a gene editing tool. It is a gene editing tool that involves a synthesized or man-made RNA molecule and a enzyme known as case 9. So what happens is that the synthesized RNA molecule guides this case 9 enzyme to the location of the DNA molecule where it wants to edit the gene. And it, basically the case 9 enzyme makes incisions at that part of the DNA molecule, which then in turn alters the genes, and DNA repair enzymes come in and repair the incisions. Now, the remarkable thing about CRISPR is that it has amazing, amazing applications. For instance, CRISPR can be used to mimic diseases. It can, 
uh, be used to alter genes to mimic diseases, which we can't obviously do in humans, since you know altering genes in humans would have a detrimental effect and likely result in death. Uh, and another application of CRISPR is that it can be used to determine genes that are crucial to surviving diseases. So I'd like to end off on a quote by, oh, sorry, uh, I'd like to end off on a note, um, I'd like to end off with a quote by everybody's favorite, Uncle Ben from Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. And what this means is that with the power of inventing new technologies, new medical technologies, we have to keep in mind that we are only human and that, you know, death is inevitable. Uh, everybody passes away and no device, but we can change that. And if we learn to harness this power, these medical achievements will continue. And so the, t the topic of today's discussion is change, right? It's change and how in my discussion specifically, how the medical field has changed and improved over time. We must remember that we have to harness our power, and in addition, current remedies that we all rely on today may become a thing of the past or advanced and develop into something much, much more. Thank you.